Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity Monthly Series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. This series is held, is held the first Thursday of every month and today Wendy will discuss why most data initiatives fail. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults to chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section. And to find the, and the chat and the Q&A panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value as a sense maker and analytic translator. A talented researcher and consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies, startups, and healthcare giants, her own work has focused on the application of big data solutions in health and human capital management. The, an author of books on effective communication and analytics, Wendy has pioneered the only structured system to empower a new generation of professionals who will be rev, who will revolutionize the successful application of data to solve business challenges. These trained analytic translators allow companies to convert advanced analytics into actionable solutions, building a sustainable alliance between analytic and business professionals. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Shannon. And uh, thanks for that intro. So I wanna welcome everybody today. Um, if you have joined us before, welcome back. If it's your first time, welcome. Today, we're gonna talk about failure. Um, I don't wanna get too excited about failure, but I think when we see why things don't go right, uh, we can change those and we can start to think about ways to do things better. So today what we're gonna talk about is what I mean by failure, why it's important to understand it, some reasons that people have proposed on why so many projects fail, the consequences of failure, and then I am going to provide you with one suggestion that you can do today or tomorrow um, to actually have a better chance at success. So my guess is that the kinds of headlines I'm gonna show you are not a surprise. From MIT Sloan Management, there is an overview of why so many data science projects actually don't produce value. Harvard Business Review, companies are failing at being data-driven. Forbes, why most machine learning applications fail to deploy. Another article about why 90% of efforts to transform organization and become um, more digital, more data empowered fail. And then a review that I saw saying that after 20 years of tracking, we still have not succeeded in creating dashboards that get used and that the average in 2022 was still that 70% of dashboards that get created don't get used. So this is a lot of effort and um, planning and implementation that doesn't go right. And so we all, experience a tremendous amount of rework or starting over or disappointment because we don't get it right as often as we should. If you look at articles where groups like uh, Gartner and Standish and several others review series of projects to see what's the failure rate this is the kind of numbers that you see. 85% of big data projects don't succeed. 87% of data science projects don't get put into production. 80% of analytic insights deliver no business value. 50% of 
of business decisions are still made without using data, even when data are available. 90% of data transformation projects fail. So these are big numbers. Even if it's half that, they still are huge numbers telling us that we aren't doing the way we should. So this has been a very, um, a very important topic for me as I experienced it. I'm guessing that many of you have experienced this in your own situations, in your own jobs or in past jobs. And so I've also spent a lot of time reading the few reviews where they went back in, like with forensics, to say, what were the reasons that things failed? And in this graphic, the red ones have to do with people, organizations, or communications, not technology. Defining the wrong business objective, not having a business case, not scoping it right and not communicating. Plus, if you ask the data people who are actually doing the work, they say that they waste almost half, 44% of their time. And if we look at the blue again, these are the things that are not technological. They're not even about data quality. They're about the interaction between data teams and business teams. So people don't respond. They don't collaborate well. The requirements aren't clear. So when we look at these kinds of problems, we realize that the answer won't be getting a new technology. It won't be migrating to a new platform. Because if the problems have to do with people and not about insufficient data or technology resources, the wrong tools or systems, not the latest and greatest technologies, but maybe it's more about how we talk to each other or don't talk to each other. So I wanna share with you a report that I wrote at the end of last year. It came from a set of interviews of 20 senior level data executives. They were chief analytic officers, chief data officers, VP of analytics. And I asked them a series of questions in these interviews. I asked them about the dynamic that they experience between analytic teams and business teams. And I'll tell you that the first question they asked me back was, do you have to publish my name? <laughs> so they wanted to be honest, but they didn't want anybody to know that they were honest. So we did not list who it was. We asked them how this dynamic impacts the analytic teams, how it limits the potential value to a company, how big of a problem it really is in terms of how successful they can be, and then why they believe that this dysfunction, these lost opportunities actually happen. So they gave me four categories of reasons. The first one is something that's familiar to all of us, the pace of work. What they noticed is that too often they would get a cryptic, urgent request from leadership. I need detailed predictions by tomorrow and we don't even know what they're talking about. They send these kind of requests over text or in Slack or just as they walk by in the hallway, if anybody's even in the hallways anymore. And so they expect things to be quick and reactionary. And then because they're urgent, there's a limited time to clarify 
or make sure that they're answering <clears throat> the right question. Now, this isn't surprising. I did a survey last year of analytics and of um, business teams. And the business team says, um, the analytic team says, you know, they give me a request and they give me very little context. They don't want my input. And so they describe the interactions with business as either frustrating or at best okay, because two thirds of the time they're getting requests that they don't really know what to do with. So this isn't something that's a one-off. This is the majority of the time that we see requests coming to analytics that are way too quick and way too um, poorly defined. The second thing that the leaders said was, you know, business leaders don't really understand what we do. So this falls into the literacy category, but even beyond literacy, a, a lack of real awareness and comprehension about what is possible. And so the result is, is that bitter business leaders don't necessarily value what's being produced because they're not quite sure what they can get. They may also have a bias because they believe certain things. And if the data come back saying something different, they don't necessarily trust it. An interesting discovery that they reported was that they felt like the business leaders considered all the data functions as a cost center, meaning it was taking resources and diminishing the profitability of an organization rather than thinking of it as a potential revenue generating kind of a department. So they're thinking it's weighing the company down rather than building it up and increasing its value. And then they admitted that they as analytic and data leaders really aren't that great at advocating for their own um, value. So this was a, a really compelling answer that they had that we have a lack of communication at the very top. It's not just a request that we get that we don't understand. At the very top, we don't communicate well. The next thing that they said was that there are big disconnects because of how siloed these two groups are. And it was funny getting a visual of a silo because I, I can't say that I have seen that many silos um, actually. But if they are siloed, it means that the different teams may be pursuing different goals because they aren't particularly aligned. There might even be competition in addition to a lack of coordination because they have different ways that they think money should be spent or different targets that they think should be um, in the crosshairs that the business goes for. And they're based on different kinds of information. And then they noticed that a bigger company, the biggest companies are the most segmented. So you have people in different places, not coordinating and understanding what the other side does. And then the last one, which is near and dear to my heart, there are different tech temp, uh, definitions and terminologies. And so the specialized language that one team uses may or may not be understandable to another one. And what they pointed out was that the analysts may get a really quick request and they will fulfill what the business is asking for, even though the business may know, not know how to ask for what they need using language that makes sense to the data team. So there you are with people asking for things, not understanding each other and the terminologies within each team, not only is not understandable, but they may make assumptions that the other team knows what they're talking about or that they are aware of things 
that each team is very clear about, but the other one is not. So in addition to understanding why these things happen, I had questions for them about what the consequences are. And they described very low morale and high levels of burnout because workers who were doing their best to provide high quality data and reliable answers feel unappreciated because they might get an answer back that that wasn't what they were looking for. Or that wasn't the answer that the person wanted. So they feel uh, low morale. They also feel like they are doing things over and over again, hitting their head against a wall. There is a high rate of turnover in data professionals because they think that maybe this is this situation is unique to this company. So if they go somewhere else, it'll be better. And very often it's not. Then once you have one person who's burned out, low morale, feeling underappreciated, it affects the rest of the team. And then once you feel like people aren't appreciating you, you start to worry more about getting it wrong than coming up with innovative new ideas. So these are the answers I'm getting from leadership in data departments, that they are clear that there is a problem and that it's big. We also discussed, well, what kind of a consequence does that have for business? And I would say the majority of, majority of them said that the company is making decisions without full information. And so those decisions aren't always the right decisions. That mid-level employees who are being told they're supposed to be data-driven aren't getting encouragement from the senior leadership to actually go seek data. That because they aren't getting what they think they need because they don't know how to ask for it, they start to doubt whether or not the data departments can give them what they need. And so they stop using internal expertise. And if they don't like the answer, they hire outside consultants and rely on the external experts. So you can see that this set of discussions from these 20 leaders was quite um, demoralizing. It was quite alarming. And when I asked them, so when you put all this together, how much less effective is your team than they could be? Thirty percent said they are half as effective. Another twenty percent said they are seventy to eighty percent less effective than they could be. Even the ones who didn't want to put a number on it, often said a lot and an impact. And I will tell you that the one interview where they said, we don't have any of these problems, um, it turns out the CEO is a data scientist. So the CEO knows what it takes to produce the output that she wants, that the CEO understands what the barriers are and what the limitations are. So as we think about this, we realize that failure is common, failure is significant, and the impact on both data professionals and business professionals is huge. So when I start to talk to people who want to solve this problem, the place that I start is talking about how our different environments are very separate. The business environment and the analytic environment is what I call it. You can call it the data professional environment and the business professional environment are very, very separate. They're separate in how they look at the world. They're separate in how they're trained. They're often separate in their personalities. There's so many things that are different. And they start to not like each other because they're not getting what they need. So 
So the way that I like to start is to point out that the business environment is very likely full of talented, capable, well-intended professionals. And the data environment is also filled with talented, capable, well-intended professionals. Too often because we have history, I hear data professionals saying those business people are so ignorant, they have no clue. And the business folks say, all those folks on the data side are so in deep in their own world, they have no idea what it takes to do our work. And so if we think about typical projects or typical initiatives, what usually happens is there's a request from the business. That request goes to someone in the data environment and they create a design, whether that's of an analysis or a new data system or a um, dashboard or some other type of data initiative. So they create a design to try and meet the request then they do the work, again, whether that's analytics or building platforms or other types of initiatives. Then they package up the results and then they throw it back over the fence to the business environment and hope that it's what the business team really wants. So the problem here, as we've talked in many different ways, is that there is a real gap in understanding, a real gap in understanding by language, um, by needs, by limitations, by possibilities. And so the analytic and data folks don't always truly understand the business. And the business often does not understand what's going on in the analytic side. So when I think about um, this process and when I teach people who want to try and solve this problem, uh, I put the projects into three phases. There's the design phase, there's the do phase, and the deliver phase. And what I notice from analytic type people is that we have a bias we can't wait to get started and get our hands on the data. We can't wait to see what we can find. We can't wait to actually do the work. And then we look forward to delivering amazing discoveries because our whole goal is to provide something that is valuable, that is useful, that could actually change the way things are done. So we like to live in that do phase and deliver phase. And what we've seen is a whole lot of attention on that particular delivery process. And when I say a lot of attention, <laughs> what I mean is I just went this week and took a look at Amazon. And there are lots and lots of resources on data visualization, data visualization, data visualization, data visualization, data visualization, storytelling and data visualization. There are over 6,000 books on how to better present your information back to the audience. Now there's good reason that people really want to focus here because when I did a similar survey as the previous one and I asked the um, business team to say what are you getting from the folks that you work with over there in data analytics they said I whatever they give me I, I don't understand what they give me and that's two-thirds of so two thirds of the data folks think they don't get enough instruction on what they are supposed to do. And two thirds of the people who get the results don't know how to use them or understand them. 
So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things, of situations that I've been in, and then we will talk a little bit about um, what we can do with those situations. So let me first talk about Tim. Tim is uh, the head of HR. And he has a history of really cryptic, urgent requests for help via email. So let's suppose that Tim says, I need all the data you can give me about who is quitting the company. And oh, by the way, can you pull that for me by Thursday? That is the request that we might get from Tim. And so what happens in this situation, very likely, is give me everything that you know about quitting. So the team says, all right, let's show him all the rates of quitting by all of these different variables. Let's show him by job type, by location, by gender, by age, all sorts of different ways that we can just cut it by just about everything that we have. We do that. We put it into a set of spreadsheets and we send it back to Tim and say, okay, here are all the spreadsheets that show all the turnover rates by every variable that we can think of. I hope that meets your needs. So then let's look at a different interaction. This one is Sarah. She's the CEO of a startup. And you might recognize a person like this. She loves buzzwords. She just loves to talk about the newest, latest, greatest stuff. And she really wants to be cutting edge. So she comes into a meeting with the other leaders in the organization and says, wow, we need the client dashboards to be way more compelling, especially when I show them during sales calls or investor calls. So can we use AI to help answer their questions? So what happens in this case? Well, what happened in this case was, can we use AI? Sure. In fact, we would love to do that because we haven't been had a chance to really use that. So let's find a large language model that helps us build a chat bot to answer questions that we train based on all of our previous information and what it is that we do. So then they do that development and develop a prototype and send it back over. Here's a demo chat bot that we can use to give clients or people who are prospects answers to their questions. Okay, so that's the typical way. So let's think about what happens when teams jump into doing the project without the context without adequate definition of what the person wants, without an understanding of the underlying goals, and without establishing criteria for how they're gonna use that information. This is what happens all the time. And when I'm talking to students, this is what they typically see. Now, there is an exception because I know there are some of you saying, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't have that problem because we don't allow it to happen. And the way we prevent it from happening is we make them define those specifications so carefully that they have exactly pinpointed exactly what they're going to get. And then we make every single person on the team sign off. And that way, when it's wrong, because uh, it often is wrong, then they know whose fault it is. It's their fault because they signed off. And then they develop a really detailed specifications 
This is how many fields you're going to get. This is how many comparisons you're going to get. And they will be tightly defined, very limited. We'll tell you how you're going to see it at this frequency. And those comparisons, just so you know, they're going to be direct comparisons. If the N is big enough in each of the groups at a p-value of 0.05, and it will use bar charts. And so they define it to death. And yet it doesn't make it more likely that they get what they need. It just makes it more likely that they're going to be afraid to ask because they know they're going to have to sign off and not necessarily blame anybody else when it doesn't go right. So I've seen both. So for those of you who are going to tell me we don't let it happen, often that's because the pendulum has swung so far in the other direction that it takes forever for a project to happen. So I've seen both ways. So for right now, I want you to answer these questions. Um, that obviously, I'm not going to call on you. But I'd like you to answer the question of these six things. Do you have that information before a project starts almost always or not always? So it, do you often know this or not? So let's start with the first one. So before you start a project, do you know the question the business really wants to answer? And usually people say, yeah, uh, most of the time we do. We know what, what the question is. Do you know the decision, the decision the business wants to make or the action they wanna take? I mean, specifically, do you know what they are deciding when you give them the information back? Because businesses rarely look for information just because they simply want to know. That's academia. In business, they want to make a decision or take an action. So do you know that? So do you know the criteria the business would use to make that decision? Now that one, often the person requesting the information hasn't really thought that through yet. It's not that they don't know, but they're not quite sure. So if they don't know yet, you probably don't know yet. Do you know how else they might use this information? How else will it be useful to them? What else might come up because of it? Do you know which audiences are going to use the answer? So is this going straight to the C-suite? Is this going to be operational managers? Is this for clients? Who's going to use it? Do you know this all the time? Or not really? And then what are the other requirements? How soon do you need it? What format do you need it in? Or are you guessing a lot for how they want it back? So think about how often you know all six versus maybe you know one or two. If you don't have that information, there's probably a case to be made that we need a different way of defining projects. So what's interesting to me is despite the fact that everybody spends their energy and there are 6,000 books of how to package results better, I have only found three books on how to define the right question thoroughly and openly in the first place. So we're getting better and better at showing the answers, even if we don't know what the question is. So my suggestion is just something that you could do today is before any project, you do something a little bit different. And that is you have a conversation. You have a conversation with the people who are most likely to be requesting services from you. 
you have a conversation and the goal of that conversation may surprise you. The goal of the conversation for that person who will be a requester is that they feel seen, heard, and understood. That's it. That is the goal. You want them to feel seen, heard, and understood. You want them to feel like you really get where they're coming from. And so your goal for yourself is to try and understand their environment before any particular question comes. Assess their general understanding. How much interaction have they had with data teams before? What has their experience been like? Building a trusted partnership, that's what you are trying to do. And that happens when you listen. To gauge their awareness of what's possible. Too often they make requests because that they can request certain things that they know are available, but they don't know what's possible. And then to always confirm what you heard so that they know that you have seen, heard, and understood them. The goal for this conversation is not to offer any solutions. It's not to correct them. It's not to educate them. It's not to pepper them with detailed questions. It's not to show them how smart you are. If you need to give them some solutions later, if you need clarification later about very specific things, you can do it at another conversation. Right now, the only goal is for them to see you as an ally who understands them. So here's a few of the sample questions. So tell me about your current priorities. What else is your team focused on right now? What challenges do you anticipate in the next few months? So are there any types of information you wish you had to make your job easier? Now they may not have an answer right now, but when you ask it that way, it'll stick with them and they'll start to think about it. If there were ways that the data team could help you, what would that be? What would those be? And you don't suggest anything, you just ask. Would you be open to a regular check-in so that I am better informed about what you need? So this conversation is about building rapport. It's about understanding their context and it's about building partnership. So the reason why we do this before any project starts is that that allows us to understand a great deal of the context around what you will do when they do ask you a specific question. So when they ask for things with very little context, you're trying to set it up so that this isn't the case. So that you have already an orientation to what's going on with them. And instead of saying, oh my God, they're just trying to set us up to fail, which I have heard that exact sentence multiple times. They are giving you a quick request because they are busy and they may not know how to articulate what it is that they need. So our director of HR, Tim, who has a history of cryptic urgent requests via email, this was the hypothetical question that I listed originally where they want, he wanted to know everything he could know about quitting and he wanted it quickly. 
And our answer was to give him a whole bunch of spreadsheets. Well, actually, we had a conversation with him first before he made a request like that. And when we had a conversation, we found out that executive leadership was giving him a ton of pressure because their turnover rates were so high. They wanted Tim to come back with actionable solutions by Friday. So hence the urgency. And that something that we didn't know was that the executive leadership is most interested in the people who are quitting early, like in their first year. Tim had limited understanding of how anyone in the data team could help him. And he admitted that actually he was gonna ask for basic information the same way that I phrased that question. That was what he was going to do to see if he saw the data Maybe it was going to be all women, or maybe it was going to be all entry level jobs, or maybe it was going to be all senior level jobs. He didn't know. He just wanted to come up with ideas. And as we had the conversation, we realized that what he really needed was a predictive model that anticipated which employees were quitting, who was at high risk, and as much information about why as we could determine. Now we couldn't get him that by Friday, but we could set him up with some information plus a promise that we were gonna have something actionable. And since then it has become a very successful project where he knows department by department who's at risk and he knows what the, um, the not necessarily causes, but the, the likely um, causes upstream from a department that was going to have a lot of people quit. And it was a whole variety of information he didn't even know that we had about what the demeanor is, what the quitting rate was last year, how um, advanced and experienced the manager was, and a whole variety of other things. But rather than being irritated because he's the kind of person who sends these cryptic um, kinds of requests, we had to empathize that he was under a tremendous amount of pressure. He doesn't understand what he could have. And so we had a great conversation. On the other hand, we didn't have a conversation ahead of time with Sarah. And so when she didn't like the chat bot idea. Um, this was what we she asked for. We want it to be more compelling. Can we use AI? And they said, here's a demo chat bot. It's really cute. We can have them answer questions based on um, training it on all of our previous uh, content. And actually, that wasn't what she wanted. What she really needs is for the products that they have to stand out and to stand out dramatically because they're going for an, another round of investment. And whether it's really, really fancy or not, it needs to look compelling to not only clients, but to investors. They believe that the valuation of the company is gonna be way higher if they can say that they successfully implemented AI. But Sarah isn't quite that advanced to know what AI really means. So what she really meant was she saw a demo where an AI tool could convert simple verbal questions and turn that into actual data queries. So it was a piece of information that, she, that they could get from their own data, not a general answer based on previous content. So she wasn't thinking about chatbot dialogue. And so we had to back up and start over and had to repair a little bit of the trust that came from not doing it right the first time. So the way that I would say what to do to begin besides being trained as an analytic translator and understanding all of these things at every phase, you can simply start with 
a little bit of context, which can take you a long way. If you simply understand where people are coming from, trust that they aren't doing things just to irritate you. They are doing things because that is the way that they are trying to handle their world. And so when we talk about the request from business and what we're going to do at this first step, which is so, so, so important, we actually are trying to go from what matters to the business team to what matters to the analytic team. And we won't get into it today, but what we have to realize is what matters to each team is very different. And so while the business wants to know a particular um, topic, a particular answer, and they have a decision they wanna make, they wanna use the data in a particular way for a particular audience, and the analytic team wants to know whether they can answer that question. Do they have the right data? Do they have uh, the right capability? Is the project even feasible based on manpower and what they do know exists? If they can meet the expectations of whichever audience it is and whether there are alternatives that they could suggest. So hopefully this gives you a lot to think about when you are facing a situation that is tense on both sides. And so to start with, I just always suggest have a conversation. Don't let it build up where you wonder where they're coming from. Have the conversation to help each other understand what's happening. And then um, just to let you know, and Shannon can um, announce it when it actually comes to fruition, but uh, we are going to incorporate analytic translator training and communication for data professionals training into Dataversity um, in the very near future. So I will stop there. Wendy, thank you so much. And I'm so excited that we will be uh, offering this training. As you know, I just believe in it so much. And I know people who have taken it who just rave about the training and the need for it. And thank you again for another fantastic presentation. Um, as I dive into the Q&A here, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel for, if you have questions for Wendy and to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here. So Wendy, can where can we access the lost opportunity data darkness, not data driven? I'm will, also interested uh, in accessing the altruistic state of data science and analytics report. Okay, um, I will, um, you'll send me that question so I'll, I can find that I'll tear state of science. Um, but uh, I will attach for when you send out the slides Monday, I will also send out the report. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, and what are the three books for the design part? Um, one of them is how to be an analytic translator by yours truly. Um, one of them is, um, I'd have to look the exact title, but it is um, communication for, I'll look it up, but people skills for analytic types. And then there is one other that I found because I was trying to scour, but I, I can find that title too. So. Perfect. And for now, I put your your book in the chat for everyone. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, approaches, or what are the approaches, or one approach to assess communication? Assess communication. I'm not sure what that means. Um, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll ask the questioner to maybe clarify, but I'm guessing like, is there um, some kind of maturity level? Or like, is there, um, assess your skills? Like, you know, how how skilled are you in communication? 
Okay. Um, I don't know a formal, um, I don't know of a formal assessment. There is a lot of literature on, um, on listening skills and how well people listen and how well, for example, there's a lot of literature on how well bosses listen and what effect it has on their employees. And usually that assessment is done by observers combined with the person who's talking and being listened to, how often they um, interrupt, how often they get distracted. Do they look away? Do they look at their phone? Um, do they confirm and maintain eye contact? Do they have body language that shows that they're interested? So some of it is um, subjective, but some of it is actually quite objective. And then there are particular skills that you can recognize um, whether or not um, people use the right tone of voice, whether or not they frame questions before they um, ask them, whether or not they know um, how to structure the kind of conversation that they need to have. So I would guess that if that's what you mean, um, I don't know of an assessment. I, I'm guessing there is one, but a lot of it is subjective. Thank you. So when you, do you have any experience with um, SAF or with SAFE, SAFE? And do you have an opinion on how that alters experiences, uh, alters experiences by the team. I do not have experience with that, so I will have to look it up and see what that means. Yeah, I'm do not you, sure. Yeah, I'll have you, to look it up myself, huh? Yeah. Uh, and Donna, if you want to, you know, add in some insight in there too, I'd love to uh, and expand on that. We can get that to you. Um, And lots of comments in here, uh, which I love. I'll get those over to you, Wendy. Um, do you think the problem differs between government and private industry? Um, the only major difference that I have seen is at the pace. Um, for whatever reason, many, many government organizations uh, operate more slowly um, and carefully. Um, they don't want to, um, uh, they're more cautious, so they're less likely to jump in and just try and get something solved or answered really quickly. But I do see just as much misunderstanding between the operational part and the data part. Um, sometimes governments actually have uh, you know, grants for particular types of analytics, um, which is different than um, private industry. What, what I always said is uh, it, because academia is in many cases very government-like. And I always said that in, in those situations, you have to get funding in order to answer the question that you want to answer. Um, and in business, especially when you're a junior person, uh, the money's there, but you don't get to answer the questions you want to answer. <laughs> so um, it's a trade-off either way. That's so very true, Wendy. I'm, I'm giggling here under my breath and muted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how do you prioritize requests for multiple people and departments, even when having the necessary context without over-promising on your team's ability and capacity? Well, this is where it's, now I know that it's not always possible, but this is where trying to be a silo buster helps. Because if you have four requesters in four different departments, they also need to be aware of um, the competing priorities. So at the highest levels that we can, we need a decider who will decide which things are the highest priority. 
because that shouldn't necessarily be the data team's decision, which one is the most um, important when it's actually the business functions who have to decide which is important. And at some level, somebody can, can decide that besides your team. So again, those kinds of conversations are conversations that need to happen and say, we are trying our best to support everyone. And we can't make a decision about priorities without understanding where everybody's coming from. How would you best like to get together so that you can help us make the right choices? Thank you. Uh, any advice um, books on how to sell leadership on investing in training tools um, to expand the data analysis capabilities when budgets are so tight? Um, I think that it helps to have somebody come in and shake up what people think the problem is. So maybe they can't afford to do a, a, a massive literacy training across the whole organization. But, and, and maybe they don't understand exactly what the problem is. Because if you say, oh, it's just liter it's literacy and the only solution to literacy is to train every single person, that, that makes it difficult. But if leadership can spare 45 minutes to hear what the problem is, meaning exactly what we talked about today, that there need to be ways to interact with each other that help us. And maybe all we need to do is train for analytic translators to be in meetings to help be that conduit. That's a different, clearly a different investment than, um, all, than trying to train every single person. Which is a great pitch, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, oh, so back to one of the original questions, Wendy, you know, do you have any experience with SAFE? Um, so SAFE, the definition she added in here is SAFE is a mashup of strategies, frameworks, DevOps, agile, lean with a customer focus, value streams that drive how development is actually done in an enterprise. It's really an agile focus. Okay. Yeah, I I like, uh, you know, I, I did the training of Lean Six Sigma back in the day. Um, it's it's a pretty intense training um, for any of you who have gone through even Greenbelt um, to be able to understand it. And people who don't understand statistics, it, it's a big um, it's a big bite to take uh, and hard to swallow. So I like the agile an iterative approach that, and a couple people mentioned it here in the in the comments. I, I do like that, but if you're not communicating well, you can even get those things wrong. Because if you don't know how to extract what the person really needs, then just because you do it in smaller bits doesn't mean you get closer. So we often rely on these methodologies. We're gonna use Agile, we're gonna use Lean, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. But they still ignore the fact that we don't talk to each other in ways that is empathetic and truly is trying to get at a, a partnership. So, I like that. It means that you're going to get not as off track in a short period of time. Um, but I do find that until we learn how to communicate with each other, and this is the case, not just data people and business people, but I train business people to talk to business people too, or business people to talk to customers, because we are not trained to communicate well. 
It is not part of our education. And it makes a huge difference, huge difference. Well, Wendy, that's, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Such great questions. Thank you so much to our attendees. And Wendy, thank you so much for an, another amazing uh, webinar. This has just been great. So many great questions still coming in. I'll, I'll get those over to you for sure. Um, and we'll get those resources in the follow-up, which I will send out to everybody by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording as well. Well, thank you all. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, great. Thank you. And Donna, sorry, I don't know about safe. I'll look, I'll look for it. So. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Bye-bye.